But I'm also going to talk about how we design the algorithm, which is perhaps more unusual than the algorithm itself. And I should say this is work done jointly with Diego Angaro. In fact, this formed the basis for his PhD dissertation. So a lot of what I'm telling you about is actually work that Diego has done. So to start off, when you design a new algorithm, I guess the question is, how are you going to evaluate what you did in that algorithm? And there's some obvious answers to that. You know, you're probably going to evaluate your algorithm based on whether it actually does what you want it to do. Is it correct? Is it efficient? Maybe you'll evaluate it based on how concise and clean the, the specification is. But I'm going to argue today that you should also evaluate algorithms based on how understandable they are, how simple and easy it is for somebody to grasp the algorithm. And I have to say, I don't think this is commonly done in academia today. In fact, probably the opposite, that we think the more confusing our algorithm is, the more clever we must be in order to create this thing. If we can actually make it work and it's super confusing, we must be really, really smart. But algorithms need to be understandable because typically it's hard to get benefit from an algorithm unless it's actually implemented. And the process of implementing an algorithm always changes it. It always has to get extended or adapted or modified in some way to fit its environment. And if the people that are implementing the algorithm can't understand it, don't have good intuitions about it, they're not going to be able to implement it properly and won't be able to achieve the benefits of the algorithm. And this is particularly true in distributed systems where the algorithms are pretty darn complicated to begin with. So today I'm going to talk about this issue in the context of consensus algorithms. The consensus algorithms, I, I think, are probably the most fundamental, important algorithms in all of distributed systems. They allow a collection of machines to somehow operate in a reasonable lockstep where they all, a group actually operates as if it's a single machine so that we can take a collection of relatively unreliable machines and make them behave like one super reliable machine so it can continue to offer service even if some of the, these unreliable components fail. And when it comes to consensus, there's been one algorithm that's really been the gold standard for the last 25 or 30 years. It's Paxos was developed by, uh, uh, by Leslie Lamport in the late 1980s, and pretty much all implementations of consensus since then have been based on Paxos, and people learn Paxos in school and so on. The problem with Paxos is it's really, really hard to understand and wrap your mind around. <clears throat> and furthermore, the basic version of Paxos that everybody starts with is really only solves a tiny part of the problem you really need to solve if you're going to use consensus algorithms. And so it's proven really difficult to build systems based on Paxos over the last 25 years. Many people have tried, and it's been very, very difficult. So today I'm going to talk about a new consensus algorithm that Diego and I designed called Raft. And it had the unusual design goal that our number one goal was understandability. We wanted to make an algorithm that was easier to understand. So you could develop intuitions about it, easy to explain, and so on. And then in addition, we also wanted something complete enough that you could really use it to build real systems. It covered enough of the problems that it's really simplified building real systems. And as you're going to see, this resulted in a very different problem decomposition from what Paxos has. So today, what I'm going to do is talk about Raft, but I'm also going to talk about how we design for understandability. What does that mean, and how do you actually do that, and how did that influence the design of the, of the Raft algorithm? And I'll talk a little bit at the end about uh, a user study we did that shows that it, we think that shows pretty compelling evidence that, in fact, Raft is more understandable than Paxos. And I'll also talk a little bit about the adoption of Raft. So, but first, some background. So consensus algorithms are typically used in the context of what's called replicated state machines. Now, before I talk about replicated state machines, let me step back even further and talk about a state machine. So when I say state machine, what I really mean is something, typically a program, that responds to some sort of external stimuli, such as commands coming from clients, and it manages some internal state about that. So this is a pretty general model of computation that includes a lot of the services that we use in today's large-scale data center applications. So storage systems like Memcached or the RAM Cloud project I've been working on, these are examples of state machines, the name node for HDFS. Uh, most of the things we think of as services today, you can think of as a state machine. Now the question is, how do we build really, really reliable state machines? And the model that seems to be most popular for this is a replicated state machine. And the idea is you take this state machine and you run the same state machine on several different machines. And the goal is that these all kind of run in lockstep, which means that each of the three of these state machines executes exactly the same set of commands, that is, it gets the same stimuli, in exactly the same order. 
And if that happens, then they all ought to produce exactly the same results. State machines, I forgot to mention, they need to be deterministic. <clears throat> so if you have that, they'll all produce the same result. And what we want to do is try to make this so reliable that it can survive the failure of any of these machines. So the way that happens in practice is to use a replicated log. And all of the commands for the state machine get added to this replicated log before they are executed by the state machines. So as long as we keep the logs identical, those state machines will execute the same commands, produce the same results. So when a new command is submitted to the system, so for example, this command sets z to the, to the value of variable x, before that machine can execute it, it first has to replicate it into all of the logs. And so it passes the command off to the other machines in the cluster. Everyone adds that command to the end of their log, so the command has to appear at exactly the same position in all of the, the logs. And then once the command has been properly replicated in the logs, then it can get executed by the state machines, and the original state machine returns an answer back to the client. And the idea behind this, if we do this right, then this cluster can continue functioning as long as any majority of the machines are up. So with a two-node cluster, as long as two out of three nodes are up, it can keep running and provide full service. So consensus, the consensus module is the thing that's responsible for replicating these commands into the replicated log so that we end up with the logs identical across all of the machines. And that's what I'm going to talk about today now, is how do we actually implement that replicated log. And if we do this right, again, it will work fine as long as we have a majority of the machines up, and it will survive the common failure models that we see in systems today, such as messages that are lost, or communication errors, machine crashes, as long as the machines don't turn evil, if a machine simply stops and crashes, this will work fine, and it can handle machines that are down. And by the way, I'm happy to take questions along the way in the talk. No need to wait till the end. If we start running late on time, I'll, I'll cut questions off at the end, but feel free to, to jump in with questions. So before I go on, any questions so far about the basic thing that we're trying to implement? All right, so how do we do that? Well, as I said, the, the way that's been done historically is to use Paxos for this. And Paxos is this, Paxos comes in several different flavors, but the, the most commonly studied flavor is called single decree Paxos. And this is a mechanism by which a collection of machines can agree on a single value, one value over the entire life of the system, once and for all, agree on one value. So there's a collection of one or more machines that propose values, and then we have a collection of other machines that will determine which value is accepted. And the idea is we need to accept exactly one of the, the proposed values. And it works in a, a, a two-phase process. It seems like anything involving a distributed system always has two phases. So propose phase and an accept phase. So the proposers, I'm not going to go over the algorithm in great detail because that would take my whole hour, but the basic idea is proposers pick some proposal number bigger than anything they've ever seen before, and then they send that out to all of the acceptors in the propose phase. And each acceptor checks to see if, uh, if has it ever seen a proposal number that's greater than that before. And if this is the biggest value it's ever seen, then it responds. Otherwise, in Paxos, the acceptor simply doesn't respond. If the proposer gets back responses from a majority of the acceptors, then it goes to the second phase, where it sends out that proposal number plus a value to all of the acceptors and asks them to formally accept that value. And the value that it sends out is one of two things. First, during the accept phase, if any of those acceptors had already accepted a value previously, it returns that. And the proposer will pick the accepted value with the highest proposal number, whichever one is highest. And it has to use that one in the second phase. If none of the acceptors had ever seen any accepted a value before, then the proposer gets to use its own value. It sends that out to the acceptors. Again, they check the proposal number to see if that's as big as anything they've ever seen. And if, if this proposal number is at least as large as anything else, then they accept. And finally, if the proposer gets back a majority there, then that value has been chosen. So that's the basic Paxos algorithm. It actually seems pretty simple. It's certainly very concise, not a lot to it. It's been proven correct. You know, what could possibly be wrong with this? So what's wrong with this is that this algorithm is really hard to actually wrap your mind around and understand. I mean, why does this work? And for example, if we go back up, what's to keep, it looks like 
an acceptor can accept one value and then later on accept a different value. How do we know this ever converges and that we really only reach consensus on a single value? And why is this a greater than or equal to, but that's a greater than? And if you start trying to dig in and understand this, it gets pretty hard to actually figure out what's going on. And furthermore, that's only the beginnings of a replicated log. This only agrees on one value for the entire life of the universe. So to make a replicated log, you somehow have to have a bunch of agreements on different values and stitch them all together into a log. And by the way, that algorithm from the previous page doesn't address liveness. At any point along the way, somebody can just stop responding. So it doesn't actually guarantee that we converge on a value. It just makes sure that we, if we converge, there's only one value. And by the way, how do we choose the proposal numbers and what about membership management? And so if you think that the basic Paxos is hard, it gets really complicated by the time you add all of the other machinery to do a replicated log. So let me just try a quick survey here. How many of you have tried to understand Paxos at some point in your professional career? Okay, and now those of you that tried it, if you found it difficult to understand, keep your hand up. Okay, now those of you that at the end, you got comfortable. Yeah, you figured it out, you're comfortable. You feel like you could explain it to somebody else now or implement it relatively reliably. If that's you, keep your hand up. No, I might keep your hand up if that's you. Yeah, nobody's hands are up still. It's really hard. So, and by the way, there are solutions to all these other problems. And there's also a problem with Paxos that, it's, that the base form is more expensive than it needs to be. And there's a solution to that also. But there's no agreement on any of these solutions. You know, there's papers that have been written on Paxos made simple and Paxos made complete and Paxos made complicated, Paxos made practical. There's no agreement on any of this stuff. So if you want to build a system with Paxos, the ironic thing is you have to take the simple algorithm and then add all this additional stuff on which there's no agreement and change the fundamental architecture to make it more efficient. And at the same time, you can't understand how it works. So what are the odds anybody's actually going to be able to do that successfully? And the answer is, well, not very many people have been able to do it successfully. In fact, personally, uh, Paxos just drove me crazy. So in RAM Cloud, at one point, we decided we wanted to use consensus to manage our top-level configuration information for a RAM cloud cluster. And then Diego Angaro started looking into this and said, well, we should use Paxos. That's what everybody's using. It's got to be the best thing. So I said, fine, uh, but you have to explain to me how Paxos works, because I don't yet understand how Paxos works. So Diego came into my office and gave it his best shot one day and explained it to me, and I couldn't understand. I had a whole bunch of questions. He couldn't answer my questions. So I said, okay, let's try again next week. <clears throat> and so next week, Diego came back, we tried it again, still couldn't understand it. So then I had him write the algorithm on my board, on my whiteboard. Every day I would come into my office and I would look at that and stare at that and see if I could make any sense of these, of, it's basically only six or eight lines of code, how can you not understand that? And <clears throat> I still couldn't get it. I read the papers, uh, I read the proof of correctness of Paxos and Paxos made simple. And I could understand the proof enough to convince myself that the algorithm worked. I mean, I believed that it worked, and yet I couldn't understand how. I was still, the code still made no sense to me. In fact, I didn't actually really understand Paxos fully until after we developed Raft. It was finally, to the, I had to basically build a new consensus algorithm to figure out how Paxos worked. So I started thinking, well, I think I must be of at least average intelligence among the computer science community. And so that must mean there's got to be a bunch of other people. At least half of the other computer scientists in the world are probably about as confused as I am about Paxos. Is there something we can do to make this better? Is, is this really the best we can do? And so finally I decided I'm just going to try and write a new consensus algorithm from scratch. And maybe that way I'll understand it. Maybe, you know, maybe Paxos is inevitably the only way to do consensus. And if I do this, I'm going to find the only way I can make things work is eventually to recreate Paxos. So I started working on that uh, and came up with some ideas for what, what seemed much simpler and I showed it to the RAM Cloud students. Turned out what I'd done at the time was actually hopelessly wrong. It was broken in a whole bunch of different ways. But we had the delusion, at least at first, that we could do something simpler than Paxos. And that got Diego interested in the project. And so then we spent the next six months really working together, designing a consensus algorithm. And our fundamental goal was we wanted to see what's the simplest, most understandable algorithm we can possibly develop. And then we had to figure out well, what does that mean to be more understandable and 
how do we judge whether one algorithm is more understandable than another, and then what techniques would you use to do that? And this is all stuff we just kind of tried different things along the way and figured this out as we went. But the main criterion we used is when choosing between our two algorithms, we would try explaining them, and we'd pick the one that was simplest to explain. And we tried, and if something was hard to explain, then we'd throw that one out, throw it away, see if we could find some other algorithm that was simpler to explain. And then over time, we started realizing there were certain techniques we were using that tended to make things more understandable. <clears throat> the first one is, uh, so this is the most important thing in all of computer science, problem decomposition, where you try and subdivide the problem into pieces that you can understand relatively independently, that don't interact too much with each other. And then the second one was minimizing the state space. You can think of that as getting rid of as many if statements as possible in the code. That's one way to think about it. So for example, try and develop a single mechanism that will solve multiple problems so you don't have separate mechanisms to learn and understand. Uh, eliminating special cases, make everything fall out of the common case. Make the common case just do the right thing so you don't have any special cases. Or in a distributed system, sort of maximizing your consistency and minimizing the non-determinism in the system. You can't completely eliminate them, but uh, you can't make it perfectly coherent and completely eliminate non-determinism, but get rid of those at all the stages. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm going to describe Raft for you, and then I'm going to try and interject at various points where we made decisions based on understandability and how that factored into the decision process. And I should warn you, I don't want to set your expectations too high. You know, Raft is still not trivial. It's not like we've suddenly made consensus falling over simple. Consensus is a hard problem. But we believe we've actually made something considerably simpler than what was there before. So again, it's not going to be, can't make it totally simple. But I'm hoping that, that by the end of this talk, you'll understand most of the basic ideas about how to do consensus and, and uh, replicated logs. So the first thing I said, uh, the technique we use for making things simple is decomposition. So with Raft, we decompose the problem in a very different way. With Paxos, they first did this teeny tiny cons complete consensus. That's the, the single decree Paxos. And then tried to accumulate a bunch of those into a log. In Raft, we took a different approach, a much more asymmetric approach, where we first pick a leader, pick one of those machines that at any given time is in complete, utter dictatorial charge. And then if that leader crashes, then we pick a new one. So first problem is leader election. And the second problem is how does the leader operate during the normal behavior of the system? So it receives entries from commands from clients, appends them to its log, and then pushes those entries out to all the other logs. So I'll talk a little bit about how that works. And then the third problem is safety, which is what happens when leaders crash, because they could be halfway through replicating an entry, and then they crash, and so some servers have it in that entry, and some servers don't have that. And so I'll show first one simple addition we made that keeps the logs consistent, so they, if they get out of whack, they will get back in whack very quickly. And then second, a little modification to the election process so that we only elect certain machines as servers. You can only be server if you have a reasonably up-to-date log. So I'll talk about each of these uh, separately, but first I'm going to give you just a quick demo to show you how the system works. So this is a visualization tool called Raft Scope <clears throat> that Diego built. It's available on the internet, by the way. You can Google it or go to the Raft homepage on GitHub and see this. If you, it's great if you want to play around with Raft and see how it works. And here we have a cluster with five servers. There's the five blobs here, and then we have their five logs here, which start off empty. So the way Raft works is that the servers expect there to be a leader. And so when it first starts up, everybody's waiting around to hear instructions from a leader. There is no leader, but they all have timeouts in them. Those are those little rings that are shrinking around the outside. And eventually, one of the servers will time out, and then it tries to become leader. And so it will send out requests to all of the other servers in the cluster, asking them if, if it can become leader. And if it gets back a response to those, in fact, we actually had two servers that timed out about almost the same time. But one of them won the election and became leader. And now that's, that's server five. And every once in a while, it sends out heartbeat messages to everybody else so they know there's a leader there. And you can see when they get a heartbeat message, they reset all of their little timeout rings again. So now this, this leader is in control of the cluster. Now suppose a client comes in and issues a command. So do that, I'll pop up a little window and send a request. So I've, this server five has received a request. 
and it's added that to its log, and the dotted line means around this means this entry has not been replicated safely enough for us to actually execute it yet. It hasn't been replicated. Now, if I resume the cluster, this server will send out messages to replicate that entry. And now you can see it's on all the other clusters, uh, machines on the cluster. And then the lines turn solid, indicating that now this has been replicated enough that it's safe to execute in the state machine. So now the, server can, the servers can all execute the command in their state machines. If I, just another example, I'll just issue a bunch more requests. We'll put, say, three requests in, server, and the start. And again, you'll see all of those requests get replicated across all the machines, and then eventually they can be executed by the state machines. And then finally, if we crash this server, so I'm just going to stop this server. For some reason, it stops responding. Then those other servers have their little timers that are going to fire. And eventually, it looks like server two is going to time out first. And when it does that, then it will try and become leader. It will send out a request and come back. And then it becomes leader and takes over the cluster. OK, that's once over very lightly just to give you the basic flavor of what happens. Now I'm going to go back in and talk about it in more detail how all this stuff works. OK, so the first thing you need to know is about server states. A server can be in any one of three states at any given time. Normally, at any given time, there will be one server that's a leader, and everybody else will be in what's called follower state. Followers are completely passive. They do nothing. They take no actions on their own. The only thing they do is that they expect to hear from a leader occasionally. And if they don't get any message at all from a leader, then they get anxious and they become a candidate, that's the, set, the middle state, at which point they try and win election to become the leader. And if they do win election, then they become the leader, and they stay leader until various things that can happen that make them step down and go back to being followers again. So those are the three states. There are only two messages, two requests that are used in the system. We use a remote procedure call mechanism, so request, response, exchanges. And there's only two RPCs in the RAF system. This is, again, part of why we want to minimize complexity, minimize the number of different things. There's one that's used by candidates in which they ask for votes to try and become the leader. And then one used by the leader to take entries from their log and replicate those entries out to other machines in the cluster. And actually, the, the append entries RPC is also used as a heartbeat mechanism. You can send it out without any actual log entries in it. It's got everything but the entries, and that's used to, to serve as a heartbeat in the cluster. So those are the server states and the, the two RPCs that you'll see in the, in the protocol that follows. Now, there's one other piece of information I need to tell you about before I start going into the, the specific algorithm, and that's terms. In order to do consensus, you have to have a mechanism for detecting obsolete information. Things Things can become obsolete that you need to ignore. Uh, the best example is a, someone was leader, and for some reason they didn't respond, and so we elected a new leader, and they're no longer leader. So we need to detect that that's an obsolete leader. Don't take instructions from that leader anymore. The mechanism for that in RAF is something called a term. So you can think of time as being divided up into these periods of time called terms. They have numbers that increase over time. And each term starts with an election, for a leader, and then if the election was successful, then that leader rules for that's the green period here for some period of time until that leader crashes or something bad happens, and then we start the next term. So most terms will have an election and then a, a reign of the leader. Occasionally, there may be a term where, in fact, we tried to elect the leader and the, the election failed because of a split vote, in which case that term will end with no leader and we'll go to the next term and try again to get a leader. So and I've drawn the terms in this very nice, clean fashion. But in fact, there is no global view of terms. Every server is actually going to be observing these term changes at slightly different times. And each server keeps for itself its idea of what it thinks the current term is. So the, the, there may be different servers that at the same time think that the current term is different values. They haven't, they're out of date. In order to keep this information up to date, the servers are constantly exchanging this information. Whenever one server makes a request to another, it includes its term in the request, and the response includes the term of the other machine. 
And so if either machine sees that the other machine has a later term, if you ever see that my term is not the latest in the whole system, then that machine instantly has an identity crisis. Basically, it updates its term to the latest one, and it immediately becomes a follower. It says, I am stupid. I know nothing. There are others that know more than me. I will become a drone follower now. Please give me instructions, O oh Lord. So they immediately step down. And then, by the way, if a server receives an RPC with an old term, it doesn't do what the RPC says. Never, never executes an RPC. It simply responds with error saying, dude, I think you got the wrong two. You got the wrong term, time to become a follower again. So again, the key thing about terms is that they allow us to find out when things are obsolete, to find out the best, most important, latest information. And that over time, they converge. As the machines talk to each other, if nobody's failed, if no crashes, eventually all the terms will converge on the, the latest value. Everybody will agree. Any questions so far? Uh, good question. To what degree is time factored in this? So there is no real notion of, well, the only notion of time is, first of all, these terms. So there's no shared clock among all these machines. They do have a notion of time advancing in, t in the way that terms change. And machines have to be able to measure time enough to do timeouts. So I have to do, I have to be able to tell if a particular roughly a particular amount of elapsed time has occurred, but there is no shared central clock, definitely. That would, that would cause problems if we depended on that. So I, I would say, so you don't, typically you don't assume that machines' clocks are synchronized, but typically you can assume that they all have clocks that are advancing within some rough equivalent rate. They won't advance at exactly the same rate, but that, you know, uh, uh, what appears to be a half a second on one machine is probably not going to appear to be 10 seconds on another machine. So Paxos does not assume even that, but then Paxos is not live. That is, Paxos does not guarantee to make progress. And so actually one of the fundamental rules, if, if you've studied, uh, for example, the FLP theorem, what the FL, to me, the FLP theorem says different things to different people. What it says to me is you have to use time in distributed systems if you want to coordinate them. You can't, if you can't use time, you can't coordinate distributed systems. You have to have some notion of the passage of time and elapsed time. Yeah? Quick clarification. So all outside interactions go with the leader? There's no outside world contacting any of the followers? Right. All outside interactions have to go to the leader. If you talk to a follower by mistake, the follower would say, dude, I don't know nothing. I'm just a follower. Talk to the leader. And it'll, it'll redirect it to the leader. Is that going to become a performance bottleneck? Yes. Uh, that's sort of a fundamental thing about consensus, though. By definition, we're going to have to do things on a majority of the cluster's machines anyway. And so you are, you are sort of limited by the capability of a single machine. If you, the only way to make consensus algorithms scalable is to partition the system into separate consensus clusters. But within a cluster, uh, unfortunately, there is really, it's, it is fundamentally non-scalable. Uh, can the pipelines be, operators be pipeline? Yeah, they can be heavily pipeline, where a server can be receiving a batch from one set of clients and replicating others. Yeah, you'll see more about that as I go through the, the details. Okay, so now I think we can talk about leader election. It's really very simple. I mentioned that each each uh, follower has a timeout. When the timeout expires, then it becomes a candidate, and when it becomes a candidate, it immediately increments its current term, casts a vote for itself. And then it sends out these request vote remote procedure calls to all of the other servers in the cluster. So it broadcasts a request saying, please give me your vote. When that ha after that, then one of three things will happen. First, the most common thing is it will get back votes from other servers. And once it gets back enough votes to constitute a majority of the cluster, then it becomes the leader. It takes over, starts sending heartbeats itself to heartbeats keep the cluster under control so nobody else becomes leader. And we're off and running. That's the first possibility. The second possibility is that somebody else actually timed out 
and went around and gathered votes. And in fact, before we can get any votes, they come and we get a you know, heartbeat from them saying, I'm leader. Then when that happens, you instantly believe them. Yes, sir. You step down, go back to being a follower, and listen to orders from that leader. And then the third possibility is you don't get enough votes. I'll talk about that more in the next slide. But if a whole bunch of servers try and become candidates at the same time, they might split the vote. And so nobody can get a majority. Then what happens if a certain amount of time goes by and, and nobody has gotten the majority, then the various uh, machines will time out, in which case they go back, start a new election, bump the term to the next term, and repeat the whole process until eventually somebody gets elected. Yes? Uh, when will the other nodes vote for a leader? They'll vote as soon as they get a request, so they don't have to wait for a timeout. If somebody asks you for your vote, and you'll see on the next slide, and you haven't yet given out a vote for that term, you immediately give them your vote. Uh, how do you know to switch? Well, if there's a current leader, presumably it had the old, the same values, our old term, and so when we bump our term, to a higher term number. So for example, it was term 10. Now, for some reason, we didn't hear from the leader. So we bumped our term to term 11. We'll go and ask for a vote. We'll ask for a vote from the old leader. That old leader will see that we're asking on term 11, and its term is 10. So it immediately goes back to being a follower. And then it says, oh, somebody wants my vote. Sure, you can have my vote for term 11. And the leadership will change then. The new term, the key thing there is that new term allows us to replace the old view of the world with a new view of the world. Yes? Which condition will a candidate become follower? It's if we start, it's possible that two machines both become candidate at exactly the same time, and one of them collects votes really quickly and becomes leader. So the other one is trying to collect votes but doesn't get them, it'll eventually receive a, a request from the new leader saying, I'm leader. When it sees that, it goes, ah, somebody else has already won the election. I'm not going to be leader. And so it will go back to being follower again. How do you guarantee? Progress. Progress. Yes, let me go on and talk about the correctness of this. So there, sure. Yeah, I don't have time to talk about cluster membership today, unfortunately, but at any given time, all of the servers know the entire membership of the cluster. There's an additional mechanism for how do you manage that, how do you add nodes and take nodes out. Uh, for that, you'll have to look at the paper, but I, I won't have time to talk about that. So assume for now, all of the nodes know, all of the servers in the cluster know who all the other servers are. Pardon? Uh, they do not all need to be alive. Only a majority of them need to be alive, as you'll see. So election correctness means two things. It has, it has to be safe and it has to be live. Safety means nothing bad happens. And liveness means something good happens. So the safety property for this is that we don't want more than one machine to be able to get elected leader at any given term. So this is pretty easy to do because each server will only give one vote for a given term. And it saves that information on disk. It has to be persistent. So if that machine crashes and restarts, it won't accidentally give out same vote, two different votes for the same term. And then we have to have a majority to win elections. So given that, you know, if we have five servers and one of the candidates has gotten three of those, clearly no other candidate can get three. And so we're guaranteed safety with the, this, these simple properties. However, we're not guaranteed liveness with these properties. That is, it's possible to, that, say, three servers could become candidates and they split all the votes and nobody has a majority. And then it's possible they could all time out, they all start up again, repeat this, and what keeps this process from repeating forever and never actually electing a leader? And the answer is random numbers are your friend. Actually, one of the lessons from distributed systems, distributed systems need to use randomization if you want to build large-scale systems. So the way we do it is we pick the election timeout from, random, from a random number chosen in an interval, say the interval from 150 to 300 milliseconds. So you may have noticed on the visualization that all of those timeout rings were different sizes on the different machines. It's because they all pick their timeouts differently. 
And so the idea of this is that with randomization, one server will time out first. And before anybody else times out, that first server will have made its request for votes in one election. And everything will be settled. And so this works really well as long as the time range for your timeout is a lot larger than the time it takes to do a broadcast between machines. So that's, that, it actually works very reliably in practice. You rarely, it rarely takes more than one cycle to get a, a leader elected. And you can do this with actually pretty short time. So the timeout's down in the range of a few milliseconds. It works fine. Now, this was an area where it turned out that we spent a lot of time trying to find an understandable way of doing this. And the randomized approach ended up being way, way simpler to understand than the alternative we thought about it was initially we used ranking approaches, kind of like Paxos, where Paxos has these proposal numbers and the biggest proposal number wins. We tried to somehow rank our servers so the one with the high, if there's competition, the one with the highest number wins. And then uh, people would vote for whoever was highest. But this got really complicated. It was very hard to make it live, to make it actually work if machines crashed. Uh, and we kept adding special case after special case, and there were more problems. And finally, we hit on this idea of doing randomization. And suddenly, everything got really simple. Just using the random number approach, all of a sudden, just pick a timeout. And in fact, a, a nice thing about this is the same approach works, the timeout approach for doing the initial timeout. And that also works if we get a split vote when we have to try an election again. The same mechanism solves both of those problems. Yeah, the question is, what happens if somehow uh, your machines might get heavily loaded so a server can't respond within the timeout value? So what will happen now is you'll get a server election. Uh, you probably, if, if you want these servers to provide good service, then you probably don't want them running on machines where they're not going to be able to run for long periods of time anyhow. Right, because if, if a server stops, fundamentally, the cluster may not be able to provide service. So my answer to that question, I would say, my answer is don't do that. Sort of like when you call the doctor and say, I keep hitting myself on the head with a hammer and my head get a headache. What should I do? Right? If your machines can't reliably respond in some period of time, then you're going to have to re increase your timeouts beyond that. There's really no choice. Yeah. So uh, not surprisingly, this algorithm, the leader election bears a lot of similarities with the Paxos election. Just so I understand right, the, the main difference here is the randomization. Randomization is probably the biggest difference, yes. <clears throat> right. And we didn't actually agree on a value here. This is really only the first step of Paxos. Actually, if you want to compare this, the leader election is kind of like the first phase of Paxos, and the replication is kind of like the second phase of Paxos. Yep. Uh, so say, uh, if there are two, uh, uh, what's this? Um, so how, my question is, how the follower will uh, select this leader? Is it just a first-come, first-serve? Yes, yeah, the follower just votes for whoever asks it first. Okay. And the candidates, whoever sends post it, post it yep, first, first come, first served. Yeah. Let me, I think I better move on and keep rolling or we're going to run out of time. And I don't want us to have time for questions on the later slides also. So now let's move on to normal operations. That was, that's the first phase, leader election. Second thing is normal operation. This you mostly saw in the visualization, so I can probably <clears throat> go over this pretty quickly. But once we have a leader, if a client wants the state machine to execute a command, it sends that to the leader. The leader adds that command to its own log, and then it sends out remote procedure calls to all of the other followers, asking them to append that command to their log. <clears throat> and assuming this all works and the leader gets enough responses back from clients, at some point it will decide that that entry is committed. And I'll talk more about that in the next slide. But committed, if an entry is committed, that means it's replicated enough in enough logs that it should be safe for the state machines to execute the command. When that happens, then the leader immediately executes the command in its own state machine, and then it can respond to the client. And then, over time, the leader tells all the followers about that, too. Each time it sends an append entries RPC, it tells the followers, all entries up through this one in the log are committed. And then once the followers find that out, then they can execute the commands in their state machines as well. So what happens if a, a follower crashes or runs slowly? The answer is the leader just keeps retrying 
over and over and over again until eventually, presumably, that client comes back up and works well enough that, the, that this can eventually succeed. So the whole cluster, as you're going to see, can continue to make progress as long as we have a majority of the nodes up. Any number less than a majority can be down. And by the way, this performance is optimal in the common case. The least you can possibly do is to have one successful remote procedure call to each of a majority of the servers. So we know we've got the data replicated across a majority of the cluster. Now let me just, oh yeah, question? How can we send the result back? Here, all we need is for the command to have been stored on the followers. We don't need for the followers to have executed it in their state machines yet. They can do that anytime later on. And if, as you'll see, if the leader crashes, the followers will eventually find out from the, from the new leader that this command has been committed. So all we need is for the command to be stored in the logs of a majority of the clients, and that makes the command durable and safe to execute. Now let me talk a little bit about what the logs look like. So I've shown here just a sample cluster with five servers, each one with its own log. And each log entry stores a command. I've just used mnemonics like J gets the value 2 or X gets the value of Q, just to show you these are commands of some sort for the state machines that are in the logs. There are a couple of interesting things about the log. The first one is that every log entry stores a term. So for example, this entry stores the term 1. This entry stores the term 2. The term is that that is the number of the term when the leader received that entry from the client. And I, I've color-coded the logs just for, for simplicity so you can see. So all of the green entries are entries from term 1, all the yellow entries from term 2, the blue from term 3. So these are the, this is the term number of the, the, the leader had at its point when it received the entry and it put the entry in its log. Second thing to know about this is the notion of commitment. So what makes an entry committed? And remember, the, the definition of committed is once it's committed, it's safe for a state machine to execute that entry, which means that we know, we can be guaranteed that no other state machine will ever execute a different entry at the same log point. We're guaranteed that everybody will do the same thing for that entry. And the answer is, it's safe to do that if the entry has been stored on a majority of the servers by the leader of its term. So for example, in this case, all of the entries up through slot 8 are committed because these entries, this entry is stored on three servers and you can see it happened during term 3. We have no, no leader for term 4, so we know the leader for term 3 stored all of us. At that point, it's safe to execute. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell you now why. I'll come back. You'll, I think hopefully you'll see by the end of the talk why that's safe to execute. But as long as it's on a majority of the servers, and as long as the leader knows, now the leader for term three can execute that. So we can't execute entries nine and ten yet, because they're not safely stored. And notice we have a server that's really a laggard here. Server, uh, the fourth server here is way behind. That doesn't stop the cluster from moving forward. All right, so now let me talk about safety. So everything is great as long as machines don't crash. But if machines crash, fundamentally the logs can become inconsistent. They won't all necessarily store exactly the same information at the same points. And this is an example of a cluster. For example, suppose we've just elected server one to be leader for term four. The cluster might look like this. And there's many ways this could have happened, but, but one way this could have happened is server four just crashed way back during term one, and it's been out of action ever since. So it's missing a whole bunch of entries. And then server two, sorry, server five got elected as leader for term two, and it successfully replicated some entries as much as it could. And then it received a bunch more in its log, but it crashed before it replicated those. So those have not been replicated, they're not committed, and in fact, we don't guarantee to keep those entries. In fact, those entries now, those are all stale. They're obsolete. They never got successfully replicated. Then it looks like server three became leader for term three. It replicated some entries. It had a few more that it was in the process of replicating when it crashed. So you can see you can end up with servers that are missing entries or have extraneous entries. This can result in tremendous 
amounts of potentially of inconsistency in the logs if you're not careful. And so in RAF, we tried to really simplify this. How can we make this really, really simple? And the answer is we decided the leader's log is always going to be correct. We're going to declare that. The leader's log is perfect. It is perfection. Never, never anything wrong with the leader's log. And in the normal mode of operation, all inconsistencies will get repaired. No special steps needed. Well, I'll just give you one if statement that will basically repair all of the inconsistencies. So we're trying again to simplify as much as we possibly can the number, the degree of non-determinism in special cases. So how do we do this? And the answer is it took two things to do it. The first is how do we maintain consistency? So we want, in, our goal in RAF is to have the highest level of consistency in the logs. Keep them as close as possible to absolutely identical. We can't do it perfect, but for example, we do not allow any holes in the log. It can never be a missing entry followed by entries that are present. And the logs are always sorted in order of term. Nice, neat, never a higher numbered term before a lower numbered term in the log, not allowed. In fact, we guarantee what we call the log matching property in Raft. This says that if there are two entries at the same position in the log, like, for example, entry 6, two entries that have the same term number in them, then you can be guaranteed that they also have the same command and that the logs are completely identical up to this point. Guaranteed. So this, this reduces, this, by maintaining this property, we eliminate a whole bunch of problems we might have to address in trying to reconcile inconsistent logs. So that holds for entry 6. Notice that doesn't hold for entry 8. The two entries have different term numbers in them, and so there's no guarantee that they hold the same command or that the logs are the same up to that point. And by the way, this also says that we can't copy entry 9 from this log to that log. That would violate the rule because if these entries were the same, the logs would have to be the same up until then, and they're not. So we can't move that entry. We have, if we want to copy this entry down here, we have to clean up everything beforehand. So one of the, uh, the side effects of this, by the way, is that if one entry is committed, all the preceding entries are committed as well because we know that if an entry is on a majority of these machines, it's on a majority of all the other machines as well, all the other early entries as well. So how do we maintain that property? It's done with a really, really simple modification to the append entries RPC. Whenever the leader sends out a log entry to another machine, so suppose the leader wants to send the entry for slot 4 down to this other follower over here, in addition to that entry, it includes the index, the log index, and the term number from the preceding entry. And it's, so it sends all the information in the red box down to the follower. And the follower compares the term number of the preceding entry with its own entry. It has to have an entry there, and the term has to match. And if that term doesn't match, the follower rejects this RPC and says, sorry, I can't accept this right now. Now, in this particular case, it does match. And so the follower will add this entry to its log, and then after the operation, the log will look like that. However, Imagine this case, where the follower seems to have some extra junk left over from term one. So we send this entry down to the follower. It compares term two with term one. Those don't match. So the follower refuses to accept this RPC. It leaves its log as it is. And now what the leader does is the leader says, ah, we have an inconsistency. It simply backs up one and tries again with a bigger chunk of data. So this next time around, it will go back and send two entries. It'll send these entries, th entries three and four, and it'll send the term number for slot two. Now, those term numbers match. And so the follower will accept these new entries, put them in its log, and by the way, when it overwrites entries like this, it clears everything after that in the log. So now the follower's log looks like that, which matches the leader's log. So this simple rule, it's basically an induction step. It says once the logs get in sync, this rule guarantees you can't add on to the log without maintaining that, that synchronization. And so just the normal mode of operation, as the leader works, it's going to force every follower's log to perfectly match its own log. Yeah. Is 
<clears throat> right, the problem with Paxos is it's really hard to stitch together all these different commitments. It's much easier to think about a log that we do nice, clean appends where we can have relatively deterministic, consistent log. It's, it's right, it's, 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 so here's the, the idea was to make the algorithm simple enough you could just see that it worked. You know, that sort of, that you, your intuition that it works is natural and correct and you can kind of verify correctness that way. Each node needs a unique number. The only unique numbers you need are these term numbers. Which, pardon? So, for example, there can be two that have the same term to the same leader. Uh, there, there cannot be two leaders for the same term. Because that's our, our, our leader election prevents that from happening. So, The nodes correspond to the logs, right? So here we have one node that's the leader and one node that's the follower. Each log entry has to have a unique index here. Yes, that's true. The log has indexes that, that increment naturally. Yeah. Very good question. How do we know this log hasn't been executed by the state machine? Hold that for one more slide. So, because we've been assuming the leader's log is correct. So, as long as the leader's log is correct, right, then, then if the uh, follower differs from it, the follower must be wrong. Okay, so now your question is, well, how do we know the leader's log is correct? And so that's the last piece of safety, which we call the leader completeness property. So what we want to guarantee is that once the log entry has been committed, Whenever a machine is elected leader, it will hold that log entry. So as long as the leader always holds all the committed entries, and then it copies its log to all of the followers, we know that we're never going to lose a committed entry. We'll never overwrite a committed entry. So then the question is, how do we guarantee that leaders hold all entries? And the answer is we added a little bit extra to the election rules to do that. Let me show you an example. So in this slide, we have an example of... of five nodes. I've left out the commands now. I'm just showing the term numbers in here because that's all that really matters in the log entries. And we're about to elect a, a leader for term four. So you can see entries up through eight have been committed. You can also see we don't want to elect server two. It doesn't hold that entry. We definitely don't want to elect server five because it holds all these bogus entries that would conflict with what we think is the truth. So how do we keep that from happening? And the answer is that when a candidate requests votes, it sends out information about its last log entry. So for example, if server one asks for votes, in every request it'll say, by the way, my last log entry is in slot eight, it has term three. And then the, the voting machines will compare that with the length of their own log, and they will deny the vote if their log is more complete than the, than the candidate's log. And how do we decide completeness? That's based on the combination of the term and the index. So, for example, if my log ends in a higher term than your log, my log's more complete. If our logs end in the same term and my log is longer than yours, then mine is more complete. So, for example, if server five tries to get a vote, it can't get a single vote from the cluster because everybody's going to compare and see, oh, my log ends in term three and yours is term two. My log's more complete. Server two can get a vote from server five because it has a higher term, but it can't get a vote from anybody else because its log is shorter than everybody else's. So the result is this really simple rule keeps anybody from getting elected leader unless they have all the committed entries. And so that's just now valid. We basically made an assumption that leaders have to have, a, leaders log has to be perfect. And then we made sure that the leaders log is in fact complete. Yep. If you have a network partition, uh, so the thing about a network partition is uh, you still have to have a majority of the servers to run. So there can only be one leader left in the cluster after a partition. You can't have two separate leaders. Uh, if you partition, absolutely, one partition cannot compute. Yep. yep. And I realize I'm running really late on time, so I think I better, let me skip through my last couple of slides. This is the main part of the RAF. I just want to talk about a couple of evaluation stuff, and then I'll wrap up, and I'm happy to come back and, and revisit any of this stuff in questions. 
So in terms of, so that's the, the complete raft algorithm. In terms of, of how to evaluate it, it's been evaluated a ton of different ways. There's formal proofs. Diego did a part for his dissertation. A team at Washington has written 50,000 lines of cock code to mechanically check the whole thing. Uh, Diego has a C++ implementation. There's others as well. He's looked at the leader election pretty thoroughly. What I want to talk very briefly about is we did a user study to try and validate the understandability. So the question is, how do we know it really is easier to understand than Paxos? And the answer is we got students in a couple of operating system classes to participate. We divided them up into two groups. Uh, each group would learn one system by studying a video, take a test, then see a video on the other system and take a test. And then we compared the results of that. I don't have time to talk about how we, how we set this up. Trying to do this fairly was really hard, trying to make the videos so they really were fair and equivalent for the systems. And the quizzes were equally hard for each system. You know, we didn't stack the deck and have the world's toughest Paxos quiz with a bunch of softball raft questions to compare against. That was... So actually, initially, we wanted to use different instructors, have somebody who really loved Paxos to give the Paxos lectures and somebody who really loves RAF to give the RAF lecture. Uh, the problem was the person who was supposed to do the Paxos lecture kind of flaked out on us. And so then, actually, I, I gave it my best shot. I, the videos were online. You can actually look and see. I think I did actually a reasonable job at, at giving a Paxos lecture. <laughs> and by the way, I should say, a lot of the students already had prior Paxos experience. So Paxos was a little bit favored in the experiments. So the results are, this shows this, their scores on the two tests. So the, the Paxos score on the x-axis and the RAF score on the y-axis. I'm not going to go over all the statistical details. You can look at the paper for that. But you can just see visually there's a lot more data points above the diagonal than below. That means students generally did better on Paxos. On average, they did about 25% better. So they did better on RAFT. They did about 25% better on RAFT. If you do a linear regression where you factor out prior Paxos experience, the expectation is students would do about twice as well on the RAF test as the Paxos test. And my favorite little bit of statistics, all of these blue X's down here near the origin, what happened is that if a student learned Paxos first, they did worse on both tests than if they learned Paxos second. And, and it's statistically significant. We don't know why that is, but it's, it's almost as if learning Paxos, trying to learn Paxos gets you so confused you can't understand any consensus algorithm. <laughs> and then finally, we surveyed them afterwards. This is just opinions, which you thought would be easier to implement or explain, and you can see that, again, RAF was pretty strongly favored. So in terms of impact, I, I will say this was really hard to get published. Uh, I think the idea of understandability as a metric was hard for program committees to get comfortable with. And honestly, I think complexity impresses program committees. Making something simpler, people somehow think there's no art or difficulty there, when in fact it's, it actually is pretty hard to make things simple. But ironically, on the adoption scheme, RAFT has been amazingly successful. There were more than 25 implementations before the paper was finally published, because we released early versions of our paper, and people just started implementing it. There's almost 100 implementations now on the RAFT homepage. It's out of date. A lot of them in production. And furthermore, it's starting to get taught in graduate operating system classes. And I find it ironic. What does it mean when they won't accept a paper at a conference, but they want to teach their students <laughs> that paper? Go figure. But anyhow, personally, I'm much more happy with the adoption stuff. I'm willing to tolerate the, you know, the rejection on the left side in order to get the adoption on the right. That's personally what I actually live for as a computer science is to have something that's really impacting people. So there's a bunch of other information available on this. Uh, there's several parts of RAFT I haven't talked about. You can go to the paper or to Diego's dissertation. Actually, one humorous note is Diego's dissertation must be one of the most widely read dissertations in all of computer science. There's a RAFT mailing list, and people will write into the mailing list with questions about it. And people say, oh, well, just look in section 5.3 of Diego's dissertation for that. And so it's as widely cited and quoted as people discuss the RAFT algorithm. Uh, there are other algorithms besides RAFT and Paxos. If you stamp replication, Zookeeper are the two examples. I'll let you hunt out those for more details. So just to conclude, I really think that understandability is undervalued in algorithm system design today. And I would love to see the world spending more time on that. I think it would make our systems much better if we designed them explicitly thinking about understandability. And two things to think about, decomposition and minimizing state space. Trying to do this. Second, making a system simpler 
it can have quite high impact. People, there's, there's a hunger for that. You know, I think Raft has made it easier for people to build consensus systems, and so a lot more people are building consensus systems now that wouldn't have even tried with Paxos. And the third, Paxos is not going away. It's, it's still, it is the, the tiniest, smallest, most concise description of consensus. So it, in that sense, it's interesting. But I think from the standpoint of both implementation and teaching, I think Raft is better. It's, it's easier to understand and a lot more complete than Paxos is. So finally, in case you're wondering, why did we pick the name Raft? Well, there's three reasons. First is that Raft stands for replicated and fault tolerant. Second, a Raft is something you can build out of a collection of logs. And third, a raft is something you can use to get away from the island of Paxos. <laughs> Thank you.